So my name is Professor Lynn Chereau. I'm uh, first name is Bonnie. I work over in Leisure Hall. I'm the executive director of the Chapman Center for Rural Studies, and I'm a professor of history. Specifically, I'm a professor of environmental history, and um, what we do in the Chapman Center is we do undergraduate research. We're the only undergraduate research lab in the College of Arts and Sciences. We have paid internships, and uh, right now um, we have 16 people working in the center, including three faculty, five staff, and the rest graduate and undergraduate students. And we do everything from, um, we have an online publication, um, database a platform for publishing undergraduate research that was it's produced by Omeka by the Center for History and New Media out of uh, George Mason University but we also do a lot of other digitization projects and we are currently working with three different historical societies and we are putting together an exhibit for the Flint Hills Discovery Center that will open in September of 2016 so a really busy little corner <laughs> of the of the uh, of the campus <clears throat> but my area of expertise as a professor is environmental history and as a result I have, been, I have taught on and off in NRES since I arrived here in 1998. I don't, I think I've lost count of the number of times I have co-taught <clears throat> in NRES. I don't think I've done it for the last four or five years, probably not since I took over ex as executive director, but I'm very supportive of NRES, I think interdisciplinary work is uh, actually incredibly important. It's very difficult on a large research-based campus to do so. We're very balkanized, we're very siloed, we don't speak to each other. One of the first insights that I got working as an NRES professor was that we were anticipating that you guys would work together when we couldn't. Seems a little hypocritical right off the bat. So I hope that um, you'll accept um, what I have to say today and not as the answer, but as a tool for helping you understand the other aspects of your projects. And I'm hoping that we have a few minutes afterward that you can tell me about your project and I can help you try and figure out how to apply this kind of big picture stuff to help you find the answers to the questions that you're looking for, okay? So I'm gonna start out with what is environmental history? <laughs> Most people have no idea what environmental history is. Um, and it's actually not very old and um, it started around Earth Day. Um, Earth Day happened in 1970 and the idea uh, for Earth Day came to the founder of Earth Day who was Senator Gaylord Nelson who was a US Senator from Wisconsin. And it's just like it sounds, Gaylord and Nelson. Okay, And this was right after the <clears throat> 1969 massive oil spill in Santa Barbara, California. None of you were born. Just Larry and I. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. There's four of us in the room <laughs> who were alive during the Santa Barbara oil spill. And at that time, this was a big shock. We are so used to oil spills now. We are so in almost, uh, it's a regular um, risk that we take. We accept that risk. Nobody, nobody was very thrilled um, in this case, and of course, television was still relatively new. Um, people had not seen the effect of a major environmental disaster in their living rooms before. And this is sort of happened at the same time that people were not used to seeing a war on television as well. And so the Vietnam War is really the very first televised uh, world conflict. And people suddenly saw uh, young men uh, in uniform and um, Terror, the terrible ravages of the Vietnam War in their living rooms every night. And so people were already open to witnessing activity in other parts of the world that were not immediate to them. And so the Santa Barbara oil spill became an incredibly sensationalized event. So inspired by the student anti-war movement, uh, Senator Nelson realized that if he could infuse that energy of the, of the student movement at the time with an emerging public consciousness about the increasing problems with air and water pollution, it would, it would force environmental protection into a national political agenda. It would push it into the spotlight. What he understood was that there was a lot of um, worry about the environment, but that wasn't being articulated in a way 
that people could understand it. So he announced the idea for a national teach-in on the environment. And there were lots of other teach-ins. There was teacher teach-ins on the war. There was teach-ins on all kinds of things. We had Timothy Leary experimenting with, with drugs and stuff like that. We had a lot of information expansion on campuses uh, led by faculty. And he announced this national teach-in. And he persuaded Pete McCloskey who was a conservative Republican, um, to serve as his co-chair in this national teach-in. And then he had recruited a, a young man named Dennis Hayes to coordinate an event. That event became Earth Day, and Hayes coordinated, had 85 staff members. Today, we laugh at that idea. The idea that you could create a national movement with 85 staff members is hilarious. I think there's probably 85 staff members just in the Chicago office. Of, of one nonprofit. So, <laughs> um, so as a result, on the 22nd of April in 1970, 20 million Americans, which was a lot at the time, took to the streets, parks, and auditoriums to demonstrate for a healthy, sustainable environment in a massive coast-to-coast -coast rally. Thousands of colleges and universities shut down and organized protests against the deterioration of the environment. Groups that had been fighting against oil spills, polluting factories, power plants, nuclear energy, raw sewage, toxic dumps, pesticide use. You might remember Silent Spring came out around the same time. Um, freeways um, and air pollution from freeways, the loss of wilderness, uh, urban sprawl, the extinction of wildlife. Suddenly, they had a common label that they could talk about, which was the responsibility of human beings to think about the planet. And, the, and Earth Day was born. So Earth Day 1970 achieved a rare, a rare rather, a rare political alignment between Republicans and Democrats, between rich people and poor people, between city dwellers and farmers, between wealthy tycoons and labor leaders. The first Earth Day led to the creation of the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the passage of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, all of which became law under the Republican administration of Richard Nixon, something that we frequently don't remember. It was a gamble, said Gaylord Nelson, but it worked. In 1990, a group of environmental leaders then asked Dennis Hayes to organize another big campaign. This time, Earth Day went global, and it mobilized 200 million people in 141 countries and lifted environmental issues onto a world stage. Earth Day 1990 gave a huge boost to recycling efforts worldwide. This is really where the recycling movement came from and help pave the way for the 1992 United Nations Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And we've had subsequent Earth Summits since that 1990 Rio de Janeiro um, event. It also prompted President Bill Clinton to award Senator Nelson the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1995 for his role in his, as the founder of Earth Day. So how does this relate to environmental history? Well, it raised a lot of questions. Earth Day raised a lot of questions that people were openly talking about at lunch, you know, over the dinner table, with their friends, and in numerous forums. Some of the questions were being asked, can the Earth continue to sustain life? Can the Earth actually continue to sustain life? How long do we have? Should there be a limit to population growth? The projections for human population growth, even in 1970, were astounding. And they have all been correct. The projections for population growth are correct. One of the things that K-State is involved in right now is this global initiative on food which Kirk Schultz talks about, and you might read it in the Collegian, or you might read about it on the K-State today, that in the next 30 years, we have to produce as much food 
in the next 30 years as human beings have produced in the history of the planet. That's where the projection of population is going. So back in 1970, people were asking themselves these questions. Can the Earth continue to sustain life? Should there be a limit to human population growth? And the big one, do human beings have any responsibility, moral, religious, economic, or otherwise, to living things other than themselves? Does it really matter if wolves go extinct? Does it really matter if we just basically eat everything? <laughs> what's going what's to happen? What's the effect? Aren't, aren't people the most important? Or are they? Or is life so diminished without other living things that there's no point in trying to sustain human life? Or maybe human life isn't even sustainable at all without the lives of other creatures and living systems. And of course then people wanted to know, was like, wait a minute, how, how did this even happen? How, how did we get to this place? Environmental historians basically seek to answer those questions. They're still trying to answer those questions. And it turns out to be a whole lot more complex and messy than maybe somebody thought in 1970. So the first environmental wave of environmental historians really sought to answer that last question, how did this happen? When did pollution become acceptable? When did it become okay for a river to catch on fire? Because there's so much pollution on top of it. When did it become acceptable for entire species of animals to suddenly disappear? not because of environmental change or a meteorite hitting the earth or an altithermal or a, you know, a, a, a major cold snap globally that lasts a thousand years, but simply because we ate them all or took them all out. And how do we explain the forces at work that actually allow us to see the dynamic factors at work that lead to environmental change? It was clear that the world used to look one way and now it looks a different way. How did that happen? And more importantly, why did it happen? So historians seek to ask more often than they seek to answer what or how, which is the actual technical, fact, technical progress of things changing, they seek to know why. So historians have kind of a, a, big, a, a really big question that they ask about the Earth especially environmental historians. So you notice that I did not say an environmental change, I did not say that environmental historians were going to answer the question of why did we end up with environmental degradation? Why an em in environmental crisis? Why unsustainable practices? Environmental historians did not ask the question in a moral way and says, you know, hey, we have to fix things. They weren't trying to raise, they're not trying to raise consciousness, they're trying to explain. Because not all environmental change is negative. For certain species, certain environmental changes can be fantastic. You know, if you happen to be a cedar tree in the Flint Hills, an environmental change that ends burning practices is great news. Okay? It's really great news for the cedar wax wings and the cardinals too. So not every species, not every system suffers under change, but it does change. Okay. So one thing you have to understand is environmental history is not the story of environmentalism. Environmentalism is, is literally advocacy for the planet or for the environment. And environmental historians are not all greens. So change over time can be judged to be beneficial as well as destructive. So that's really important to know about what environmental historians do. Which leads me to some definitions. How do environmental historians define a basic thing like uh, environment? <laughs> what do they mean? Well, one of the primary contributions of environmental history and the related field of natural philosophy, you know, how do we think about the nature 
um, was the recognition that in Western culture, of which we are enmeshed, most people in this room are enmeshed, we have long separated the idea of nature from humans. When we think about nature, we don't put people in that picture. We put grandmother tree and Bambi and Thumper, but there are no people in that picture. This has a very long history of its own, based in Judeo-Christian belief that created a hierarchy of creation that placed human beings above animals and other living beings in a caretaking position, but also in a separate position. And also the Judeo-Christian belief that animals and plants and things do not have souls, they do not have an afterlife, and therefore our time on earth is temporal and, and temporary, and therefore there's a, another sphere of existence which has made it more difficult for people who uh, believe in an afterlife to take their effect on the ecology of the planet or the environment of the planet more seriously. If you think you're going to check out, <laughs> you know, and life is not very long and you don't see environmental change in your lifetime very profoundly, it's hard to see the big picture um, in terms of environmental change. So, I won't diverge too far about why we say patently mythological things like the pristine wilderness or mother nature or virgin land, why we, why we uh, genderize it into these mythological creatures that don't really exist. But suffice it to say that in terms of understanding environmental change as a human, as an historical idea, uh, the science is very clear that human beings are part of nature however you want to define it. In fact, our physical needs, our use of resources, our management and manipulation of the earth are by far in front of all other living beings on the planet. To use a term from ecology, we are the keystone species. Straight up. We are the keystone species. If you want to look at the most wide-ranging shift activity uh, uh, deriving from human behavior, it's nothing else than agriculture. The vast majority of the world's ecology has been changed most often by agriculture over tens of thousands of years. So how do environmental historians go about the business of explaining environmental change? So some of them study the history of environmental policy. That was pretty obvious to do because all of a sudden we had all this new environmental policy. So they're like, whoa, you know, we have the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and we even have Superfund and everything like that. Did, how, did, how did we manage this before? You know, things just don't pop out of, the, out of no place. Clearly there's been some regulation in the past of some kind. And so a lot of environmental historians looked at the creation of these different codes of ethics, local laws, water law, riparian water law versus other kinds of, of laws. And so there's a lot of policy history, the creation of the national parks, fishing regulations, mining laws, 1872 mining law, any other, there was just a host of attempts by our collective will through the rule of law to regulate and exploit the resources of the day. People have always had to strive to share resources and there's clearly been things in place that have um, regulated how that happens. So, But this al almost always leads directly to the study of how resources are valued in our economy and the inescapable, the inescapable conclusion when you look at environmental policy is that for most of American history post-Columbus, <laughs> not, not pre-Columbus, but post-Columbus, is that the history of the United States has lo been long the history of turning resources into commodities. Commodities that can be bought, sold, invested, traded, monetized, and even invested on them not even being here yet. 
which we call futures. How, how does that affect the use of resources? Well, obviously it affects it pretty profoundly when we monetize things and we turn them into board feet instead of trees or we turn them into acre feet instead of a lake. These change the way that they are used. And one of the things that intensifies this process is something the human beings are really, really good at, which is technology. Technology changes the ability of our and intensity and rate at which we use resources. Rate is something that's really underrated. You know, and people say, oh, well, there's always been this and there's always been that. And I'm like, yeah, but how come we're doing it a thousand times faster now? And doesn't that make, doesn't that make a difference? <laughs> so technology really can intensify a process. And we sometimes, so what we call that entire thing is we, I call it with just a P. for production. That whole aspect of monetizing resources, turning them into commodities, giving a value to them in terms of the economy and exchange value, and intensifying that through technologies we call production. So some of us cer <coughs> study certain resources, that is non-human resources, although there have actually been attempts to study human beings in the same way. And some environmental historians have focused on the use of one resource through time. And these have led to some really interesting studies. There's a book out there called Salt. That's all it is, just the history of salt, or the history of just coffee. And where did that come from? And where, does, where did it go? Or just the history of just sugar, another commodity. Um, or we might focus on the history of forests, a forest, or a river, or a particular species of animal. What is the history of wolves in America? It has a history. Wolves are not just wolves. I mean, they are. <laughs> but, and they all, all are gen genetically indistinguishable from each other. But what is the history of wolves? I mean, where have they been historically? What did they do? What did they feed on? Where did they go? What happens when they come back? Which they do all by themselves. So wolves, bison. What's the history of bison? Almost extinct in North America. Almost extinct in the United States, not extinct in Canada. So the combination of a very small herd from near Anadarko um, Oklahoma together with um, uh, an Alberta Basin group of bison essentially is the foundational bison herd for what is the American bison today but it was down to a few hundred animals in the United States. Bison have a history. Tall grass prairie has a history. Five percent of it left based on you know um, lots of really good scientific study and historical documents and descriptions, newspaper articles, survey maps. We know that 95% of what was originally Ptolemy's grass prairie is gone. So in short, this is the story of ecological systems. And for that, historians rely, very, environmental historians rely very heavily on the insights and work of ecologists. Ecologists and geographers, scientists. So environmental historians have to dabble in science, God forbid. And so my poor students, my poor graduate students, I send them over for hydrology class or ecology at graduate level and they drowned and they have no idea how to get to maximum sustainable yield as a mathematical factor and they just about want to kill me. But they have to understand the science of the system that they want to focus on. Okay, and finally, and this is the hard one, environmental historians have to figure out, or they have to trace and mark and describe what is going on in people's heads. What is going on in people's heads? 
what do human beings actually think they are doing when they interact, which we must all do, with the environment in maintaining themselves physically, socially, economically, over time? Do people think they're doing? How do they make decisions? And what do they think the consequences of those decisions are going to be? Or maybe they don't even think about the consequences of those decisions. We can call this culture, we can call this values, we can call these uh, world paradigms, world views, and like ecology and economy, these cultural beliefs also change over time. The things that we value in our society today are not the same things that people valued in the past. And they're likely not to be the same things people are going to value in the future. Culture and cultural values have a history. And we can call this historical force cognition. Fancy word. Just means what's in your head. So we have production is the P. E is ecology, the science of the physical limitations of the natural or so-called environmental world. And C is cognition. Okay. So a lot of factors to keep track of. Think about your project. You're like, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to try and figure out all these factors in my project? A lot of stuff to weigh in terms of importance, to trace, to test. Pretty overwhelming. And what's even more amazing and messy is that all of these factors cannot be studied independently because they are dynamic. They all act upon one another. They all, a change in one affects changes in the other. The Oglala Aquifer is a really great example of this. I'm glad John's here. And it's familiar, which is nice. So, you know, it's not a system like I'm talking about nematodes somewhere and someone has to ask me what a nematode is. Okay, so why are we running out of water? How is it that we went from billions of acre feet of water to predictions that certain parts of western Kansas will have no fossil water in 25 years. And in some places it's already gone. In the Yano Estacado it's pretty much gone. How did this happen? We all know the pumping of water underground is unsustainable and yet we keep pumping. How does, that, how does that work? Are people just crazy? That's the one thing that I tell my students in history right away is that I, although it's very tempting to say people are crazy, the answer is almost always no. People are not crazy. They are totally rational within the limits of their ability to understand the situation. So here we can see the three factors of ecology, production, and cognition. The ecology of the Oglala is pretty straightforward. We didn't even know the aquifer existed until the mid-20th century. Now it's mapped out with extreme precision. We have come to understand the effects of pumping on the soil, on plants, salt seed or anybody, on the above ground and underground rivers and streams, on riparian systems, on wildlife, and even ourselves and the loss of communities. These are dictated by the physical characteristics of the resource, the slow recharge rate, the chemical composition of the water, etc. This is the science. So why did the aquifer even become a central feature of Western Kansas ag agriculture? And here we can look to factors of production. It's the economy, stupid. It was Bill Clinton who said that, I believe. Settlement through laws, through having the government make and in, create incentives for that settlement was encouraged through policy. Some of those policies you're familiar with. The Homestead Act, the Railroad Act, the founding of agricultural colleges like Kansas State University. There's a Morrill Act which pr provided support to those people who wanted to come to Western Kansas and create homes in a largely dry place. Policy generated demand, and thousands of people made this their home. 
And what did we believe, getting into cognition, what did we believe was the purpose of all that settlement? Well, we had a belief system. The people who came had a belief system. They believed in the benefits of land ownership, in the right of every citizen to own land who worked hard and wanted to have something for their children left to them through inheritance. Some people call this the American dream. It was a philosophical connection made by the founding fathers, particularly Jefferson, who believed land ownership led to democratic stability. A person who owned their own land, who could sustain their own them, themselves and their families through their own independent hard work, in spite of all the government handouts that got them the land in the first place, that person could not be influenced in their choice of candidates for political office, and therefore they were free. It's a foundational belief of American society. And that freedom was defined for the majority of Americans from the moment they landed at Jamestown in 1607. What, did, what does that mean, that freedom that Americans would have? It always meant from 1607, at the time that um, the Virginia Tobacco Company was founded, it meant the accumulation of material wealth through the buying and selling of co commodities otherwise known as capitalism. That is a worldview. It is not a, it is not a ecological fact. <laughs> it is not a physical fact like gravity. It is a worldview. So that is our three-part model of the environment when it comes to the Oglala Aquifer. Think about that. You have, those, you have that philosophical mindset that says this Space, this property, was meant to provide resources, therefore money and commodities to me, the owner. Foundational belief. The ecology kicks back at that and says, well, I'm really sorry. As much as you would like to keep doing that, I'm going to go dry. <laughs> and the production of that becomes really clear as more and more technology puts more and more pressure on that resource and makes it more and more possible for an individual landowner to continue to do what they're going to do. And we lead, and it just, it's a race to empty. So that's the three-part model of using one example of humankind in the environment, or sometimes I say humankind in the biosphere. The biosphere is an even bigger concept than environment. We think of environment as something that we can literally physically touch and experience ourselves. But the biosphere is actually a lot more meaningful because it takes in the, the effect of forces on like global climate over, the t over a period of eons, millions of years, the effect of gravity on the tides, meteorites, volcanic eruptions, ice ages, altithermals, sunspots, holes in the ozone, things that you know, we read about in the paper and we don't think about very much but actually affect our lives every single day. That's the people in South Carolina today, <laughs> whether they're being affected by um, biosphere. Okay, so let's talk about this little model up here. It's not very, you know, I'm an historian, I'm not an artist. I try to tell my students to think about this model as three buoys in the water. So think of those, those are supposed to be buoys. <laughs> And they're each tied to each other in a triangle. As one buoy is disturbed and bobs up and down, bobs up and down in the water, it sends a corresponding motion to the other two. Maybe the effect is less, maybe the effect is amplified, but they cannot be separated in this dynamic dance. And so it is with understanding change over time in the environment. When we make a change, either cognitively, for example, hey, you know what? Beaver pelts make great hats. Fashion change. It affects the work of the production of humans, who then start to harvest that resource. Let's get all the beaver. And leading perhaps to extinction, which it did. 
in numerous states across the United States. That in turn affects the ecology of the system in which that resource was found. No beavers means no ponds, which means changes to fish population, which leads to changes in bird and wildlife populations, which leads to stream bed erosion. You get the idea. So if the dynamic model of independent but interactive forces explains how things happen, how they affect one another in history, what's causing the boys to move anyway? If the ocean or the water in which they're sitting in is the environment, including us, we're in there too, what's causing things to move? What's making things happen? Well, the answer is given to us by a wonderful environmental historian named Carolyn Merchant. Not important, but just thought I'd give her props. She's from Berkeley. And she pointed out that what's really making things happen over time is reproduction. The engine of change in environmental change is reproduction. And I do not mean sex, although that is a vector for reproduction. She, suggest, she, she suggested that all systems, human, animal, all living systems, strive to reproduce themselves over time. That the life force of reproduction, that is the passing down of genomic materials from one generation to another, is imperfect but mandatory and shows up not just in the physical manifestations of new beings, but in the reproduction of the conditions that allowed that reproduction to take place. Let me think about, think about that. You can't just have the reproduction of genomes from one generation to another. That's easy to do. We can all do corn tasseling. But what really matters is how that reproduction is made possible. Okay. So then we get the reproduction of the systems that created that, those beneficial conditions. Families are better for reproducing kids. Geese that mate for life and take care of each other are really good for reproducing geese. You get the idea. Having one dominant male horse in a herd actually is useful to reproducing more horses because it leaves that energy of the other young males available for protection and other aspects of herd health. There's just a million different ways in which the conditions are reproduced along with the reproduction itself. But in, and this also includes the reproduction of economic systems. One of the big things that is it, contemporary today in your generation is this huge hue and cry about the fact that you are not going to do as well economically, likely, as your parents. That the economic conditions under which you are, the initial conditions of your economic life when you graduate from university are less favorable than they were for your parents. And this is actually a cause for a great amount of alarm because we think about those conditions as being necessary for the reproduction of life as we prefer to have it. Traditions are also a way of reproducing conditions for reproduction. Traditions based on religion, traditions based on cultural values, housing, architecture, we like things to be a certain way. They don't have to be that way. But we reproduce those traditions through preferences. Bureaucracies reproduce themselves. Government systems become stable. Bureaucracies in law, bureaucracies in uh, corporate behavior also reproduce themselves. A CEO who's making buku bucks is not going to bring down the system. He's going to reproduce it. Even knowledge is reproduced. The knowledge that creates the conditions 
for our sustained life in the future is reproduced. In fact, I have just partially reproduced my understanding of humankind and the environment by lecturing you today. Consider yourself reproduced. <laughs> so the model is not perfect and it does not substitute and cannot do the work of ecologists or economists or cultural historians, but it helps us to see what might be at work and to help to us to untangle the threads of environmental change in meaningful ways. So I'd be happy to talk to you about your projects and how you might use the model to help you figure out your project. What projects do you have they decided on projects yet? It's halfway through the semester, I would think so. Okay. Um, ours is on uh, ecosystem services and uh, incorporating uh, prairie patches into urban setting. Mm. So yeah, we're trying to figure out kind of the benefits that you get from that and then we can also study the history of prairie systems. Okay, and so that's the ecology. Mm -hmm. So and you're also looking at the cultural impacts mm -hmm. and how that changes the perceptions of students and people's views on the prairie setting versus turf grass. What aesthetic values does that add? Mm -hmm. So we've got ecology and cognition. Production I'm trying to do. Yeah. Production. Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> in what ways can we make, can you make production, the commoditization of your, of your project, appealing so that it will be reproduced? It's less maintenance. We won't cost it. There you go. That's um, good. We won't like release as much greenhouse gases with maintenance and that kind of cost. Okay. So you can appeal to people's status. And yes. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I just think there has to be an economic gain for um, people who don't have to buy into the, the concept of being environmentally sustainable. There has to be an economic gain for them involved. Well, believe it or not, that, that economic gain can frequently simply come, that, that sense of economic gain can frequently come in terms of status. So. People who shop at Whole Foods, they're doing it for two reasons. You know, they want that nice organic asparagus water <laughs> for six dollars a bottle. But they also want to have Whole Food bags hanging around in their apartment. They want people to know that they can shop at Whole Foods. They can afford it. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that gets sells a lot of these ideas is the idea that you know you were showing off your your environmental um, responsibility and your greenness to neighbors by having a little intertillage crop of prairie grass in your lawn because you know not everybody has that you know it becomes a status symbol that's one thing one way to think about it Are you, gonna run, are you going to run into um, reproduced and long-term traditions of legal problems with that? Probably, the, um, like some people don't like the wild look, and so maybe there's like a law saying that grass can't be certain heights or oh, that's right. certain developments. So, like, yeah. like if you're in private residential areas where they have like certain rules of how, how many teams, teams, how your lawn is supposed to look. Not just homeowners associations, the city of Manhattan has a, has a law against, against, yeah, city ordinance against oh, your grass being higher than 12 inches. Why? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Curb appeal. Yeah, whose curb appeal? What kind of house? Huh? And not a fancy house, because this, 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 this uh, appeal, this appeal, this applies to downtown crappy student housing as much as it appeals to or applies to the city to uh, people out by the golf course. You all get tickets no matter what. 
Where'd that come from? When did those regulations happen? You don't know. I'm telling you, you should go find out. They, they, come in the, they came in the 1970s. What's at the height of the 1970s in American? American Dream. Yeah, what did that look like? That looked like a split level house in a subdivision on a certain size lot with a big lawn in the front. And that became the standard of beauty and orderliness and domestic, um, domestic care. And that is still the standard. It hasn't changed. It's out of date. It's being reproduced <laughs> over and over and over again by city commissions who don't change their regulations and don't become more flexible in allowing people to do things. And then you know what it runs right smack into? That older tradition of this is my property and I can do what I want with it. And then it runs right into the social contract. Well, if what you want to do with your property is stick a bunch of like old cars in the front lawn and then let a bunch of weeds grow up that infects my beautiful, nice grass next door to me, well, now, now we have a problem too because now that runs into a matter of personal property as well as older traditions of what looks good. <laughs> so yeah, you're gonna run, you need to know the history of urban regulations and gardens and setbacks. There's setbacks. You can't have a fence more than uh, closer than 25 feet to the frontage of your street. That's why nobody has a fence in the front yard of their home in Manhattan, Kansas. And if they do, they basically are out of compliance or they've gotten an exception through the Board of Zoning Appeals. So you're going to run right into the law reproducing certain standards. But what Gaylord Nelson did, right, was he shifted people's thinking, which then did what? Yeah, what action eventually happened that had a lasting effect on, on the American landscape, both cognitively and ecologically? The yeah! <laughs> so if you think about cognition, as starting with the individual, you know, I like meat, I don't. You start out with cognition being in the individual. When it reaches the level of federal legislation, that's a sort of like the crystallization, the apex of our desire to see things in a certain way. And what they did by creating the EPA and the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, this did not happen out of a vacuum. This happened because Americans wanted it. If you take a survey today of Americans who say, do you want more environmental, do you think the United States is doing enough to protect its environmental resources, 80% of Americans even now will say no. Now maybe not in Hayes, Kansas. But in the rest of the country, yes. There's a sense that we're just not doing enough. So that, that has sustained itself over time and has sustained the laws that keep that in place. What other project are you guys doing? To affect the temperature out, out on Kings Creek. Oh, I know Kings Creek, that's awesome. Effect of temperature. So like what caused, what may cause temperature changes in uh, prairie streams and then the kind of ripple effects it can have on the surrounding ecology. So ours is really ecology heavy. Very ecology heavy. Yeah. And because it's King's Creek, you can't talk about temperature change as a result of a lot of human activity. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a uh, benchmark stream coming. However, hmm. when we take our students up to Kanza, we look at, there actually is an angle here. We look, go up to the top of that hill in the first, in the first loop, everybody has to go to the same, same hill. <laughs> And you look out there and we talk about seeing six, maybe seven different environments all at the same time. Seven historical environments. If you look out at that portion of Kanza that has no trees at all, it's just grasses, that is essentially a native, a pre-colonial environment. Native people burned those grasslands 
most frequently in the fall, by the way, burn those grasslands for a purpose. They were managing that grass to keep it in grass, to keep out woody forbs and other plants that would prevent grazing, that would make that less valuable for grazing. And they used it as a lure to bring large ungulates to that place so that they could kill them. They harvested bison by burning grass. It's as simple as that. It's not in nature. Not if, not if Indians are not considered to be part of nature and people didn't think they were. So that was, that's anthropogenic behavior. So that's one environment. Then you look over across um, to the west and you can see farms. You can see it cut up into squares. A field of this and a field of that, greenhouses, and that's an agricultural environment. That's, that's an environment being managed for agricultural production. Then you look to the south, and what do you see? Water towers and the, um, the smokestack that's sitting right near us. And you're like, that's an urban environment, and that ecology is being shaped by that. And then you, have, then you can look into, um, toward the, the barn and the research station, and what have you got there? You have a ranching environment. That's the historical remnants of a place that used to be just simply a, an animal grazing unit. And though that barn was built to hold feed for those animals and the, the, the ranch house was there to maintain the people that took care of the animals on the ranch. <laughs> there's no big house, there's no people, no, no family out there. So what's the last environment that you see out there? No, I mean, I'm talking about an historical context for a description of why this looks this way. What were human beings doing that we can see now out here that actually represents a form of human activity like burning grass or ranching or farming or urban development? Roads and trails. Roads and trails, yes. Some of those are all part of that, so we, we put roads and trails in for both ag and for, uh, for ranching a little bit. Fence lines, okay, which ranching and farming. There's one other one though. What are you standing on when you were making these observations? You are standing on it when you make these observations. When you're standing at the top of that hill, what are you standing on? Are you standing in the grass? No. no. What are you standing on? Rocks. How did those rocks get there? People. <laughs> what people put them there? Volunteers. <laughs> what you are looking at are two new, two other additional environments that were created in 1971. One was a research environment. We have all these watersheds that are being shaped by the experimentations that are happening out there. The 20 year burn, the five year, the 10 year, the two year, the cattle section, the bison section. You think mother nature came down and did that? No. Go look at Lloyd Hulbert's notes. I'll tell you, they, mother nature did not design the experiments that are happening with Kings Creek or any other kind of ec ecological experiment out there. And they also didn't, Mother Nature also did not design the nice nature paths that you took to get to the top of that hill so that you could see all the other environments. That was part of the agreement in 1971 that when the Nature Conservancy took it over and said, okay, that's fine. We're gonna give it to, we're gonna loan it to Kansas State University's Division of Biology forever and ever, but a portion of this is gonna get set aside for recreation. So we also have a recreational environment. And when you go down to the Hokusen farm, which is a remnant of the agricultural environment, when you go down there, is it being run as a farm? No, my gosh, we have porta potties. We have porta potties and we have um, a bird viewing station. Is this meant for like little farming kids? No, it's meant for you. It's meant for you, visitors. You are consuming a recreational experience. It has been commodified. It is a cool thing 
Trust me, the Chamber of Commerce talks about it all the time. Retire to the Flint Hills. Why? Because we have some. Okay, and can I get to them? Yes, it's free. Here's the path. Go to the Discovery Center and then go out and walk in the prairie on top of the volunteer made paths. So you can go and look at uh, the nature. <laughs> it's a weird way to think about it, but it's not. It's totally logical, yes. Like Wildcat Creek. <laughs> there is no perfect control. What wilderness area? There is no. There's no such thing. They just found nuclear material at, in Antarctica. No. So Kings Creek is a benchmark, but it is a human made benchmark. We decided, the EPA and the clean water people and whoever else is in charge of measuring things, they decided that the composition of that water will serve as a benchmark. But it's partly scientific and it's partly arbitrary. So it is the result of a scientific reproduced viewpoint. Does that, does that help? And it does have an economic value because we like to think of Kanza as a pristine place and it is representative of that pristine nature and therefore it becomes a commodity for tourism in this area. Do you think it's healthy to have that sort of world view of considering any place pristine? Like, I don't think it's socially accepted as truth that even you know our fossil fuel emissions are going out into the atmosphere and acidifying oceans and all the water on the whole entire planet is of a slightly different pH because of our activities. Yet, if you just walk out and see a tree somewhere, then people tell their children, oh, we're in nature. And that honestly makes me really angry. And I really <laughs> The idea of what the idea of human beings benefit benefiting from being in nature is so old, it's unbelievable. It is old as dirt. I mean, one of the very first poems that I ever memorized was, was uh, William Wordsworth. And one of the one of the couplets is there is um, one impulse from a vernal wood can teach us more of man, of moral evil and of good than all the sages can. I memorized that at 11. And what does that mean? Nature has secrets. Nature has truth. Nature has integrity. Human beings do not. And therefore, if we go out into woods and nature and we play with grandmother tree and find Bambi and Thumper, we will become better people. And you know what? I actually find that there's something to that. That's my personal opinion. I think people who live in a sterile environment and are not connected with the environment that sustains them are, are emotionally and intellectually stunted. So I actually do believe that. I think you have to have a bigger worldview of who you are and your connection. That's why I love that movie Mind Walk. Have you guys have ever seen Mind Walk? It basically says, you know what, not only are we not separated from nature, that right now you are sharing atoms with the wall you were leaning on. We are so interconnected, it is crazy. And that sense of interconnection then gives you a sense of responsibility. So in that sense, maybe if the mom says, hey, look, there's a tree, we're in nature, maybe it can be, yes, you are 
exchanging atoms and nutrients and resources with that tree, and wouldn't it be a shame if you weren't responsible for helping it be sustained as just much as, as, as you are yourself? So, you know. I agree with you, but do you think that we're missing out on any aspect of those benefits if we don't give ourselves and our children and our children's children that honesty of acknowledging that though it's not totally nature, like it didn't. Well, there's a lot of people who get very worried when I say there is no pristine nature because then they say, then there's nothing to save and there's no benchmark and then we might as well just go out and screw everything up. But we would hope that there's some self-preservation left and some sense of beauty and some sense that even though we're part of the environment, that doesn't mean it's all messed up. We've always been part of the environment. We just in the past have, have certain societies, or certain societies now, doing a better job of sustaining all the living things in their ecosystem than we are. There's no point taking people out because we can't. But the, the question is, how do we put people in and make things better? I think my fear stems from the concern that eventually there will come a time where um, children think that it's natural to have little scraps of plastic throughout the soil and floating in the water because it's just such a long process. And even now, there's so much plastic floating out in the ocean. And there's just really nowhere in like antimicrobial viral DNA has been found way out in the ocean as far as you can get from any continent. So if that's already being incorporated into natural environments and we are a part of it and it is part of us, then how, I don't know. You have to have environmental historians <laughs> who will tell you that it wasn't like that. If, you know, one of, the, one of the best quotes I heard, and I don't know if it was Richard Dawkins, I don't think it was. I forget, maybe John remembers, but it was all history is ecology. And all ecology is history. All ecology is history. That's what ecologists do. They look, in, they look backwards to see what, what did it look like before? And how do we account for the way it looks now? So yeah, you're all welcome to come and learn environmental history. <laughs> Let's study <that> <laughs>